give time for questions. Of course. I am sure right that the audience <laughs> will ask you a lot. <laughs> Definitely. Please go ahead. Okay, uh, welcome. Let's get our brains going. Uh, I have two objectives and two only for this session. One is that you question everything I say. So don't write down the slides in terms of what I'm saying. Just question everything I'm saying. And especially if it doesn't make sense, and I don't necessarily want questions right at the end, just stop me at any point and say, Asher, that just doesn't make sense. Not from my experience. And we can explore that. Okay? For me, that's much more important than anything else. Yep. Uh, what I'm going to do is take you through the whole notion of organizational learning, because knowledge management didn't just turn up out of the blue. Before that, lots of people were exploring since the 1950s, 40s, etc. How do we learn as individuals? How do we learn as groups? How do we learn as organizations, if there is such a thing? So I want to explore what we know, and also, how do we make sense of things when something bad happens in organizations? If you get the equivalent of Fukushima happening, how do you suddenly make sense of it? And you've got to make sense of it today or tomorrow. And what, what, what are the processes that go through in people's minds, etc.? So that's my first objective, question everything. The se second objective, which is much, much more important, is to get you to coffee before time. Okay. <laughs> so I think I've got 45 minutes. If I can end early, that's even better. Because also remember that this week isn't just about us presenters somehow imparting this amazing knowledge to you, etc. It's also about you making connections. Remember, there's a tremendous pool of knowledge within this room. And it's about you making those connections because that's what's going to be fantastic when you leave here at the end of this week. It's those connections. So coffee is really important. And, uh, and, and you really need to make most of that coffee time. Okay. So let's start off with um, individual learning. Can I ask the lovely people at the back, the South Korean gang, can one of you please help me? Can we have a big round of applause for the South Koreans, please? Can one of you please help me? How, how do you learn as an individual? How do you learn? Shall I point to someone? Okay. <laughs> the gentleman in the yellow t-shirt. Yep. <laughs> can you stand up and tell us, how do you tend to learn as an individual? See, it, it, uh, you could think of it at work. You could think of it at school. How, how do you learn? So nothing. Oh, someone teaching me. Someone teaches you. Yeah. But do, do you just take whatever they say for granted? If you want to get a top score, let's say, in an exam, how do you learn? Because often I find that when I'm taught lots of things, it's like throwing mud at a wall. Most of the mud falls down. Uh, how do you retain all that? Any thoughts? No? Anyone from the Korean gang? Uh, uh, we have many uh, uh, training calls uh, yeah. in the uh, HRDI, and uh, in the in the site uh, we have a mentor, several mentor. Uh, we the first uh, oh, one uh, one or two years we follow the mentor uh, okay. acting. And so someone who's much more experienced than you are to almost sort of help you along that particular process, to learn from them, in a sense, yeah? 
Yeah. And what about when problems occur? What do you do then? So if you have a problem at work, do you go to the mentor? Who do you turn to? Uh, if you, we have a problem, yeah. Uh, oh, we uh, uh, have a uh, the the program uh, and uh, organizations. Uh, right. We talk to each other and the manager and the director. So really come together as a group somehow to sort of work out what the problem is, what some of the options are, and what could be the optimal solution possibly. Yeah? Optimize. Yeah? Okay. Right, look, uh, thank you very much for that. Um, what, what, what I'm going to do, so first of all, Look at the common sort of notion of individual learning. It's like the most common thing people tell you is about the Kolb's learning cycle, that you have experiences, things fail. And one of the important things is reflection in terms of this cycle, because when things go wrong, you reflect. Why did they go wrong? What's wrong with me that I keep on doing this again and again? And what you find in organizations, people just say, we don't have time to reflect. And therefore, you get into this action-fixated learning cycle where people don't necessarily learn much. One of the big things which um, I was pleased with the last speaker um, was this model is deficient for me. Anyone think why this is, why I think it could be wrong? There's one big thing that's wrong with it. Anyone? Give me a... It's individual, yep, yep, fantastic. Any other aspect? So it's individual, doesn't recognize, as Larry was saying yesterday, about the social relationships in learning. But the other thing, in my own mind, what's deficient, is it doesn't have that burning desire. It doesn't have that motivation, yep. It's like, I don't know if you've ever tried to teach anyone who's not really interested in learning and they've got no motivation, no matter they do the cycle, nothing sticks. Yep. So really, unless you've got that fire in your belly that you really want to learn this thing, nothing's going to happen. Yep. Then in terms of learning as groups, um, this was old uh, Peter Senge when he wrote his uh, uh, fifth discipline. He was interested in the whole notion, what do we actually do when we get into groups? And he said, well, we get into discussion and dialogue. Yep. And saying that dialogue is great because it allows us to expand. It allows us to explore and get more into divergent thinking. Not just saying, this is how we ought to solve this. And just because this book or this report says so-and-so, we ought to do it. But then saying, he also recognized that in groups, discussion is really important because at times, today, right now, we may need to make a decision. So you really, at that point, need to get into some form of convergent thinking, thinking, right, out of everything we know, and most of the time in organizations, we have incomplete information. And we have to work on the basis of that. And therefore, if you've got that incomplete information, you still have to say, what are our options? And which is going to be the most important one for us to solve this current problem from what we know? Yeah. And also saying that there are some blocks in groups. Um, you can get defensive routines. And it's interesting, um, some of you may have read, um, I think it was Chris Argyris' uh, article about why executives find it difficult to learn. And it's purely because of these defensive routines. They've been so good throughout their lives, doing so well, that suddenly, when new things turn up, they don't want to show that they're just as vulnerable as the rest of us. Yep. So they can develop these uh, defensive routines, feeling threatened, uh, or just hiding ignorance. Another in, uh, interesting thing that's come up this morning and was also alluded to yesterday, so in terms of team learning, I'm going to bring out quite a major thing, which is around these informal networks, communities of practice. Yep. 
of saying it's not a formal thing. It's not like coming into round a table in an office saying, right, what's the agenda today and so on. It's really coming together as an informal group of people who respect each other in the workplace. Uh, the classic example, of course, was uh, Rank Xerox, where they had 1,200 pages of technical documents on how to fix photocopiers. And if you and I read it, or anyone read it, no one can actually fix a photocopier using that. However, what they found was that when they got together in their, at lunch times and in their informal groups and things, they'd say, I'd say to Larry, oh, Larry, I've got this problem with this copy. I've been shaking my head for two days, just don't understand what's going wrong. And he might say to me, Ashok, you know what? I had exactly the same about two years ago. And what you're talking about, the posing problem, isn't the real problem. You ought to be looking at this, 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 and this. Yep. Which then sort of helps you and everyone else make sense of what's going around. And it develops, and one of the important things uh, Larry was quite conscious of bringing out yesterday was about stories and storytelling. It's really saying that the glue in those communities of practice are those stories. Because those stories are about individual people. They're about cognitive ideas. They're about things that happen in the workplace. So it's creating linkages between these stories and everyone that you're working with. And you can have a laugh and a joke about it. And also what's useful is the ties. So you may have strong ties, but it's also useful to have people who have weak ties. And we talk about some people who are also boundary-spanning individuals, people who can span between one community and another and another, because they're also useful, because they, don't, they stop us just being in a nice little world. Uh, I think Andrea yesterday was talking about silos. He talked about silos. We can all get into our lovely little silos, and it's saying we need these people, these boundary-spanning individuals, to cross those silos to bring in different and new forms of knowledge uh, to help us along. OK. Uh, any questions so far? No? OK. So moving to the organizational level, the problem that we have here, and I've put it's paradoxical because I've said organizations are not merely collections of individuals, yet no organizations are without such collections. Similarly, organizational learning is not purely about individual learning, yet organizations learn through the experience and actions of individuals. What then? are we to make of this notion about how do organizations learn? Put your hands up if any of you got any thoughts about how do organizations learn or even fail to learn? Any thoughts? Yeah, please. So somehow that individual knowledge is becoming dispersed around the organization. So it's not just belonging to that individual. It belongs to the organization. Yep, no, that, 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 that's an excellent start. Any other thoughts? Yep, young man. Um, um, management uh, decisions and management uh, rules and regulations is the form of, you know, goes down and then sometimes comes the culture of the organization to just do things in that way because the management has said this is how I want this to be done. Okay. So almost what you're saying is that the managers may decide this is how we do it. We heard about people, processes, and technologies. So they may decide these are the processes, these are the routines that we have, and saying that maybe as long as the routine's fine, it's a bit like we saw that film of the two women. They had a routine to sort of do the chocolates, but it got faster and faster, and they were thinking, how do we keep, keep doing that? It's not working. Okay. 
everybody. So, what, what, how, how, how do organisations learn when things don't happen correctly? Yep, yep, come on, come on through. We may just do uh, the post-action assessment or something like that. Just analyze what we did, what we could have done better, okay. and maybe do some retrospective assessment even, and uh, like the lessons learned exactly. Yeah. So it's almost like often at the end of a project, people say, "Let's have a project review. What went right? What went wrong? What are the lessons learned?" Yeah. However, I know from years of working in the construction industry, you had the same construction companies making the same mistakes again and again. They had fantastic reports saying, oh, we've learned so many lessons. And then you go to a project a year later, and they're making the same mistakes. Did you have some thoughts? This is their culture, I believe. Culture, OK. <laughs> has become their organizational culture, making the same mistake, I guess. Okay, so no, hold, hold, hold on to that, hold on to that uh, for a second. Tell me what, what cultures, we just had a talk about culture, what type of culture do you think would be good for learning and what type of culture would be bad for learning? For that particular organization, you mean? Or? Yeah, for any organization. So we just had a talk all about culture and about knowledge sharing and so on. And I'm interested in learning. I'm interested in that we, as a nuclear power plant, are learning continuously, let's say. Let's say my vision is that we want to be this learning organization. And as a nuclear power plant, I want us to be the top learning organization in the world. What is it about culture, you would say, that would help me, if I was the director of that plant, improve the learning? Well, the first is, is, second, I guess, is sharing. Okay. And first is uh, uh, to accept that you cannot know everything and you can make sure. mistakes. This is the first thing that you have to accept. That you can't know everything. Yes. Yeah. OK. If you pass it over to this young man. Yes. Yeah. Not acting as a director. When OK. Not acting as a director. Which, yeah the guy who is making the same mistake. So that it's not top are, down. Exactly. You are a director. You ignore sure. him. So yep. you, it's not important what he tells you. Okay. This is the first mistake. When you get in a room and say, let's try to find the problem. OK. You're... Just go back to this cultural thing. If I told you that I'm interested in, let's say, knowledge sharing, which we were hearing from the last speaker, a cooperative culture. Do you think a nice cooperative culture would be good for learning? Would be good, but it's not present in every nation. So, so you're saying a nice cooperative culture would be good for learning? Okay. Can I ask you, why do you think a cooperative culture could be bad for learning? Oh. Could you help me? Why do you think Cooperative cultures could be bad for learning. It's a difficult question. <laughs> but uh, maybe we have to improve uh, not only cooperative culture, but uh, the culture uh, of uh, each unit. OK. And the... Uh, the culture of uh, communication between units right and between uh, uh, top level and the middle level and the ordinary people so at the different levels you're saying yes, different need levels. to explore the culture yes what i'm really trying to get at is that often a lot of people when they look at culture and learning they think oh cooperative culture fantastic improve knowledge sharing, etc. The downside of it is a cooperative culture. Everyone is a yes person, can become a yes person. Everyone can be, oh, we're all lovey-dovey. We're all cooperative. We all love each other. We, we're fantastic as an organization. We're, and no one's really questioning what we're doing. Yeah? Everyone's just thinking, oh, but we have ni I have a nice relationship with you, and you, and you, and you. But no one's thinking, 
can we do this better? Could we do it differently to what we've ever done it before? Yeah? Yes, uh, maybe the confrontation, a confrontation not between the people, but the ideas. The ideas, yeah. yes. Okay. So we have to discuss more about uh, the best solution. Okay, yeah. Sure, please, please do, please. Yeah, be yeah. grand. I, I'm just thinking, um, because we talk about corporate culture. Yeah. And uh, we have many global companies, even in the nuclear field, that sure. they might have uh, subsid uh, some sub uh, companies that's, in different countries. Right. So, relationship between corporate culture yeah. and kind of prevailing national culture. You know that I don't know. We are Latin yeah. Americans. Normally, goes things go bottom up and, right. in a very scattered way. In some other cultures, things are very vertical, top down. That's so, right. yeah. if you if you have an ideal culture for yeah a learning organization, but this ideal culture somehow clashes with the national prevailing culture. So yeah. can, it, can, can yeah, we I'll, explore, I'll, I'll explore a little this I'll, idea? I'll explore that because, um, of course, one of the key people who've written a lot about national cultures that everyone goes to is Hofstede. And what's nice is at London University, my colleague uh, wrote a paper dismissing a lot of it, but let's explore some of the aspects. Some simple, one simple aspect is to think of national culture, for example, even in Europe, between Northern Europe and Southern Europe, being Northern Europe being more individual oriented, Southern Europe being more family oriented, yep, or, or group oriented. And again, you could say similar things between Europe and Asia, for example, being Europe being more individual oriented, Japan, Southeast Asia more group family oriented. So, yeah. I saw in my organization many times uh, some yeah. people want to help others uh, correcting their mistakes. Yeah. And the first pe person who makes the mistakes uh, don't learn. The word the person just correct, but sometimes don't teach them how to do because they hush and all the problems. I saw them many times in the first person keep going, doing the same mistakes many, many times. Right. So it's almost saying that they carry on doing that. And it's almost as um, Chris Argyris talked about single and double loop learning of really saying, do we in organizations, whether at an individual or an organizational level, when we hit a big problem, do we just carry on doing the same things the same way, yeah? which is a form of single loop learning, or do we actually explore some of the assumptions that we've used that have created this problem, and what's underlying this and then look at other ways and other options. And that's almost a form of double loop learning rather than just saying we just carry on with the same routines. Yeah. Just going back to Monica's point, because uh, she was asking about national culture, organizational culture, and organizational learning. Okay. So with Monica's question, I was saying, Really, if you even do it simplistically, national culture about individual family orientation, with organizational culture, remember that majority of people, sadly, in most of the literature, purely look at the surface norms, which is about how do we do things around here. Yep. Not many people go underneath it and saying, culture is very deep within any organization. You're looking at the beliefs, the values, the attitudes, and the assumptions. Yep. And very rarely do people explore that. And it's about whether you have, for example, an American multinational company working in somewhere like India, coming from a very individualist culture, and then the potential clashes 
of coming to somewhere like India, where it's much more group and family oriented, that there could be potential conflicts. But it was interesting that um, over um, coffee this morning, um, you don't mind me sharing this, Larry, about we were talking about Toyota and talking about the whole conveyor system at Toyota. And if you have any problems or questions, you type them in on a terminal and it comes up on a big screen. And within 30 seconds, maximum minute, people have already answered your question. Yep. So there is that level of sharing. However, Larry was sort of saying, you know what? They tried something very similar in, uh, at Ford in America. Just didn't work because of the different culture. Yeah? So it's really important that one understands the context but doesn't say that the solution is to change the culture. Because what I was pushing yesterday is changing the culture takes five years minimum. Right? Uh, even if you get rid of all the senior managers, you're not going to change the culture overnight. Yep. OK, yep. Yeah. I'm curious about you. You have experience uh, in different industries. Now you're talking sure, about Toyota. Yeah. So could you share some impressions about the nuclear corporate culture? So what you feel that maybe the main threats related to safety, like what happened when the individual when an individual makes a mistake or is outs accountable? Is it comparable to other industries? Because we listen that all around everybody says no, so everybody should be brave and willing to engage risks and uh, okay, you, you learn by failing. Yeah. I think this, this learning by failing is not really uh, sure. yeah. here in the... In well, safety the, is utmost really in the nuclear industry. However, having said that, I would say that it's really important in the nuclear industry not to isolate yourself. Yep. That's why I've been keen to look at lots of industries throughout the world to look at the commonalities that bring them together rather than, and also saying that the nuclear industry can learn from other industries, but other industries can also learn from the nuclear industry. Yep. So there's no major difference in terms of knowledge management practices. Um, I yep. something to that because uh, of course you learn from mistakes in the nuclear industry and wherever, and especially in the nuclear industry, if you take the incidents and if you do a nice analysis of, of, this, of these incidents and you use them as learning tools, of course you learn a lot. Of course you learn a lot. It's, so the only thing is that, uh, how do you manage this? But I'm, I'm talking about the culture in the sense of the perspective towards risk. So yeah. the, the willingness to engage in risk. So of course, once you make a mistake, you have to learn from that. And the nuclear industry has developed a lot of tools to learn from mistakes. But the question is, when you have to add, for example, what we saw, Elon Musk, if someone has assumed risks in the world, is Elon Musk. It has put a lot of money in companies that in principle no one believed in. How is that? How? Should the nuclear mentality or knowledge management or safety culture position before that, like uh, willingness that's to assume risk? No, that's a totally no. different yeah. question. Two uh, points safety here safety. are very important. First of all, no blame culture. I think because uh, very uh, often people making uh, nuclear mistakes without being observed. But nevertheless, there some kind of the faults are coming on, and the people uh, in the, from my point of view, good organization, they openly uh, will describe what happened. That if they know that they will be not punished for this, because it's not a crime, they made it unintentionally. Maybe sometimes tools are not good, or procedure is wrong, or something like this. This is uh, very important. From other point, regarding the risk, 
all people working at nuclear facilities should understand on which type of facility they work. And we are coming to the safety culture. Safety culture in general means that everything that you are doing, even small actions, you will do uh, thinking somewhere in your background about safety and consequences which can be here. Even simple thing, because people sometimes not predict what uh, could be the result of the action, but they should stop, think, act from the safety point of view, and then proceed. And uh, this is uh, really uh, the most important element of the safety culture. Because we are talking about safety culture. Safety culture is important. Safety standards, safety culture. People should. But what does it mean? It, each individual should understand that he is working in the risky environment. And this risky environment, not only the people who are working at nuclear power plant or another facility, but it's also, I can say, risky for the uh, environment, for society. And if each individual will act like this, and this could be part of the organizational culture, it could be uh, part of the organizational learning, whatever, and then uh, the, we will significantly reduce risks in the, our activities in nuclear. But uh, simply saying, each person working in a nuclear facility should be a responsible person in different uh, aspects. Yeah, I am okay. right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Agree? But, but it's also recognizing what we heard earlier. Oh, yeah, I, I'm fine. But it's also recognizing what we heard earlier from our last speaker, that cultures in the nuclear industry are very different around the world. Yeah? And even within a, the same country, between East and West, you'll get still very different cultures. Uh, but what we're hearing is very much about saying this whole notion of sort of no blame but learning from it as a group and collectively, that must be a way forward. Yeah. But I think, just if I can. Sure, yeah, 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 please, please, please pursue it. That is true that. Uh, You're all out enough. <laughs> <laughs> so, regarding uh, safety culture, I think it's uh, one of the most characteristic uh, ingredients of a nuclear uh, corporate. Of course, and yeah. Of course, it's true that if I, I have to avoid risks, I will, uh, the best way to avoid this is keep doing things in the same way I have always done them. Yeah. The best, best is doing nothing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So what if I have the possibility of improving safety yeah. by doing okay. something different? Something different. Exactly. That the, I think it's not that obvious or that uh, clear. And I think that's where the whole thing about um, Larry's point yesterday was it in different industries, whichever industry you're in, you're not working as an individual. You're working with a group of people. So then you may say, look, I've been here three years, and the way we seem to do this particular process in terms of safety stinks. I know everyone does it, but as a collective, I've got a proposal to do it differently. What do you all think? Yeah? so that then it's a collective responsibility. You're all taking that risk on collectively, but also getting external help if it's a major risk issue. Yeah. And trying to see if you take on that risk, what are you going to do to mitigate it if something adverse happens? Yeah? I think quite... Oh, oh sorry. Just, just, oh, yeah. Just, just to... Sorry, um, linked to, to this observation, I think a questioning attitude is a key ingredient that helps in both ways. That's right, yeah. It's how I started. Okay. Uh, yes, something I wanted to add on this uh, no blaming uh, culture, culture and yeah. also the, the learning from the mistakes is uh, like in my research group, we've yeah. got this book that we call How Not to Do. <laughs> right. So. So basically, what happens is that whenever we will take a new student, maybe in their project, they will make some mistake that will delay the project. Yes. At the end, when they are graduating, we will document what they did wrong. Right. So that when we take any new student, that book keeps on getting bigger and bigger. When we take yeah. a new student, this is how not to do. That's so basically, no matter which ideas you are having on how to tackle your problem, please don't go this way, because yes. this way 
leads to failure, basically. A lot of organizations have done exactly that. They call it error harvesting, yeah? Yeah. where they're sort of saying, oh, errors and mistakes are good, uh, but how, does, how do we all learn from it in some way or another? And so many organizations have used different techniques, but to do exactly what you're saying. Yes. I have a little problem with the error harvesting in the sense yeah, that yeah. probably how not to do is peculiar to a specific situation. Context and for and, other yeah. situations, that way may be the, the, the best way uh, yeah. for them. So when you harvest error and you kind of scare students away from doing things in that particular way, yeah. uh, probably it might not help all the students. I that, think that, that's my it's take on Maria it. Elena just said about having that questioning insight. So no matter, you may find written down, this is the mistakes we've done, but you have to say, does it apply to this current situation today? Right. Yeah? So you have to ask yourself, you can't just take it verbatim. That's why I often worry that a lot of things in knowledge management are very prescriptive. People say, do this, do that, do the other. And I'd say, one thing at least from me, take away from this whole week, question whatever you're doing. Yeah? So, can I ask a question? So how many slides you... Oh, I've got... <laughs> the slides don't matter. The slides, I've got tons over there, but maybe I'll have one more and then I'll do a few slides and you can tell... Okay. okay. Five more minutes. Okay, okay. let's... Thank you, Doug. Four questions. Okay, well, uh, questions okay. are more important. Okay, thank slides. you. Uh, before I ask my question, I would like to actually do a sort of a flashback to your uh, question on factors that actually hinders our collaborative uh, learning. Sure, yeah. Um, we shouldn't lose fact of the site that uh, we, have a, uh, we have a sort of individual learning uh, patterns. Sure. We have fast learners. We have slow learners. Yeah. And this tend to actually be a sort of a disincentive to collaborative learning experience. Sure. And that's my take on that. So we should actually look at the different individual learning uh, patterns. We should factor it in our consideration. Um, uh, my question will be centered on actually your take on the best uh, learning model. Because personally, I believe that the constructivist uh, uh, collaborative approach yeah. Is, the, is a, a good model, even though it has some deficiencies uh, as heard by Jim Piaget and Lev Vygotsky, et cetera, et cetera. But what I'm saying is, when we have a sort of collaborative learning, we tend to share our knowledge and experiences, and we build on our, our, our the, we find out that the learner himself is not just a receiver of knowledge, he's also a sort of constructor of knowledge, because he tend to also give back to the, uh, the, 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 uh, to the other members of the group. Yeah. So this is, I think, so I want to have your take on the yeah. best learning model or paradigm you, uh, that you think is best for organizations. I'd say, for me, there isn't a particular one. It depends on that context. Context, context, context. Because in some organizations, a very competitive culture can also be really useful for high levels of learning. But in others, a highly cooperative could be, but you have to also, within cooperative cultures and cooperative structures almost, have to look at each one of them is different. Is this useful to almost sort of going back to our last speaker, helping us meet some of those uh, organizational objectives? Okay, I'm just going to spend two minutes quickly whizzing through a couple of slides just so that uh, we, we talked about this single and double loop learning. Oh, this, this is a good one. Uh, I, I like this slide. This was uh, from March. It's fantastic because it talks about success and failure. We were talking about error harvesting and so on. So really saying that what happens if you're highly successful? You tend to maintain the status quo. You think, oh, everything's fine. Everything's great. We've got our safety standards. Brilliant. We're doing really well. All our graphs are showing we're fantastic. Uh, gets you into risk aversion, maybe complacency, you're into exploitation. And that can lead to efficiencies and reliability, but it can also lead to failure. Yeah. 
However, failure itself can be fantastic for organizations because then failure can help organizations look at ex uh, exploration uh, behaviors and exploratory learning, really. Saying that from these mistakes, we're going to look at why did we make these mistakes? Going into error harvesting that I was mentioning, experimenting, and that in itself leads to innovation, uh, greater resilience, and potential success in the future. Uh, I'm going to... Okay, I'll just do this one last one, and then I'll forget about all the slides. You can see them online, etc. Sense-making. It's really useful, the whole notion. We've heard that the nuclear industry, highly complex, safety is an issue, there could be uncertainty, certain things could be unintelligible in terms of environmental changes, etc. How do we make sense when something wrong or bad happens? We have various stories. We have our mental models, but our mental models are from what's happened in the past, when we try and make sense of new situations. Um, there's a situational awareness, which where we're really trying to look at what's happened in the past, trying to say, what's it mean currently, especially if you're in a crisis situation, um, and that will help us develop uh, future actions. Anyway, I wanted to leave you with that, because there were two other aspects I was going to cover. One is about dynamic capabilities. Yesterday we heard about competencies, KSAs as the HR gang call it, knowledge, skills and attitudes. Um, and I forget what, what, what else we heard. But, but an important aspect, you may, if you want to get into this area, look at how do we develop dynamic capabilities when suddenly something new happens? How do we develop some form of absorptive capacity also to develop that capacity? Not that everyone thinks in the same way, but we've also, within our teams, got people that think in very different ways. Yep. OK. Anyway, I'll leave it there. I'll Am I late for coffee? No, no, okay. Thank you very much. Is that okay? Yeah? <laughs> Thank you. No questions.